come back to the International Financial Sector Alliance Against Modern Slavery program presented by the Mekong Club. Today, we are pleased to have Stephen Farrer as our speaker. For those joining us for the first time, let me introduce Stephen to you. He is a certified anti-money laundering specialist and a certified fraud examiner. And additionally, he holds a Master's of Business Administration and a Bachelor Degree in Science with Honors. Stevens has leveraged his extensive experience in banking and law enforcement to address issues related to human trafficking and modern slavery. He has held senior positions in civil society, the private sector and government. Most recently, he worked as a consultant with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and with European Union funded programs that focus on building capacity in financial investigations to combat trafficking activities in the Middle East, North Africa and East Africa. In this presentation, Steve will outline the new business model surrounding forced commercial sexual exploitation, where online recruitment and advertising are supported by organized logistic networks, generating significant profits, often linked to organized crime. The session will explore the involvement of payments and payment systems at multiple stages and this illicit of this illicit activity and identified areas for further action in this evolving landscape. The 60 minute session will feature a 40 minute recorded presentation and a 10 minute Q&A segment. We will record the presentation, but stop the recording during the Q&A section for open conversation and for you to freely ask any questions. Only the presenter will be visible during the presentation and all attendees will be muted. Now, without further ado, please let's say hello to Stephen. Uh, thank you very much, Elena. Much appreciated. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, folks. Uh, very nice to, to be with you. Um, let me just get my uh, presentation up and uh, we can start the session. Can I just confirm you can see that? Yes, we can, Stephen. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for joining us. This is another session in the uh, the program by the Mekong Club. And I want to thank uh, Matt, Elena, and the whole team for, for inviting me here today. We're going to be talking about the forced commercial sex trafficking uh, area. Uh, and uh, just a, a bit that wasn't mentioned was I spent the last year actually working on a UK home office project looking at this area. So I'm actually just going to share some uh, of those learnings. I can't share all, of course, but that would really form the basis uh, of this session. So first of all, just to set the scene, um, if you look at this pie chart, we're going to be talking about the dark blue number uh, on the left, the 6.3 million. Now, this is the estimate of the number of mainly women and girls who are trapped in forced commercial sexual exploitation. Uh, and you see it's 23% of the known victim totals. Now, I want to just contrast that against uh, this screen. And if you look in the middle lower part, you'll see a revenue uh, number there, a pie chart. Uh, here, forced commercial sexual exploitation is 73% of the revenue. So 23% of the victims, but 73% of the revenue. And this really is a major, major revenue stream for organized crime. Very sadly, this is the one sort of golden crime, I hate to say that, that they rely on because, uh, unfortunately, it is not uh, targeted in the same way that perhaps drugs and other crimes are. And that's what I want to bring to your attention today. This is a major source of revenue. Something else I want to bring to your attention as well is, is something that Matt Friedman put on LinkedIn about a year ago, and Matt has agreed for me to share this, so thank you, Matt. But it, on the left-hand side, he put up an estimated 6.3 million women, 6.3 million women and girls are stuck 
as victims of forced prostitution right as we speak. Now, let's put this into some perspective. And as he's outlined at the bottom, he says, if each one was forced to have sex five times a day, that translates to a staggering 31.5 million acts of non-consensual sexual exploitation every day. And that would be indecent assault or rape. Folks, why isn't this number front page news? I mean, we are usually genuine concern as a society when we know one rape in our uh, community. But why are we not worried about 31.5 million? It, it, it stuns me. Being a financial investigator, I wanted to put a few numbers around this. And so I, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, that uh, I've just tried to do that. So I've put in there, if uh, 135 transactions a month per victim, uh, so that's you know a, a small number a day at 22 uh, US dollars per transaction, which again is a small number. This would generate 225 billion. If we actually increase that, to 50 US dollars a day. We're talking about up to 300 or 500 billion being generated. Now I know from research that in, in the Western countries, uh, in the, especially in the US, that forced commercial sex trafficking victims are often uh, forced to earn a thousand US dollars a day, which is uh, you know, 20 customers at 50 US dollars or 10 customers at a hundred dollars. So these figures that we're putting out aren't unbelievable, but the size and scale and volume of money being generated from this despicable crime really beggars belief. And that's why I'm very honored to be speaking to you. I believe many of you are financial crime uh, professionals. You know, this really fits into our area. Is, is there something we can do about this a little bit better to understand how we can go after the finances, identifying them and perhaps stopping them. I'd just like to share a quick video here. Uh, I hope it works. Apologies, it was a bit lumpy, but I hope you got the gist of this. This is uh, actually developed by a, another uh, human trafficking uh, agency called A21, and they've kindly allowed me to, to use this. And I, I would encourage you, uh, if you're looking for sort of video content on uh, these types of scenarios, if you're running a training internally or something, please do, do go and have a look at their website. Uh, they have a lot of really good uh, videos there on different aspects of trafficking that sort of put it really on point of what how it operates and what it looks like. Uh, and you can see in this one a, a very common methodology, an advert uh, advertising someone to go overseas, uh, and they are um, then given fake documentation, brought in, in this case into the UK, they're drugged and then prostituted uh, by some thuggish looking uh, traffickers. Uh, this all too common, this sort of methodology. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, in due course. Let me move on. So these are some slightly old slides uh, here of uh, 10, 15 years ago, warnings. Uh, but 
often sex trafficking starts with a deception, an ad uh, quite often targeting young women uh, to, to uh, you know, offer them jobs overseas or, or even locally, uh, something, you know, really appealing to their aspirations and being in a model or doing some other specialist work, something that is super attractive. Uh, and unfortunately, it is just a pit that many uh, fall into. So again, this is just an ad which I thought was very on point. Uh, sadly, you know, on the left-hand side is advertising, you know, wanting young females to go into the modeling industry, uh, but actually the true nature of it is being dragged into the sex industry. Um, so <laughs> apologies if, anybody, if I've offended anybody's sensitivities uh, with this sort of graphic detail, but uh, I just wanted to put it out there that uh, this is a very true picture, uh, which is targeting many of our young women uh, and young girls. Um, a couple of cases I just want to raise up. Uh, these are, you know, a few years ago now, but these are in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, a Malaysian woman bringing young girls into uh, Australia, into Sydney to work in brothels. Uh, and um, she was uh, found and arrested and the girls were released. But I, I just want to highlight the, uh, the judge said that the... The defendant treated women not as human beings, but as commodities, machines to make money. And this is very much the thinking behind traffickers. You are not a person that I care about or have any concern about. I just want to keep you uh, healthy uh, as enough and to control you to make money. Uh, and often victims are not just held by one uh, trafficker, uh, they also may be sold on to another group later on. So they have values in many ways, not just from clients, but also as a commodity to trade with other groups, which is uh, doubly despicable uh, and really you know, dashes uh, victims' hopes when they're being sold around syndicates uh, to carry on being prostituted. On the right-hand side is an ad, uh, sorry, a news story uh, in Auckland where a Korean victim gave a note in Korean to a Korean customer. Uh, and this was probably one of the rare Korean clients uh, who actually gave the ad to the authorities uh, and uh, a rescue was initiated. But let's be, be honest, uh, the people who are soliciting, using uh, forced commercial sex trafficking victims who are being prostituted are often not nice people. They are living out their fantasies, their sexual fantasies on a poor, defenseless young girl. Uh, so they are often not uh, the Richard Gears of the pretty woman types who are going to shower a girl in diamonds and so on. Very much the opposite. They are very, uh, you know, they also don't care about that victim uh, and their, their health, their happiness, whether they're free. They do not care. They're just seeking self-gratification. Uh, more recent stories uh, in in, uh, in Australia. Uh, these were a couple of years ago uh, where the Sydney Morning Herald did some very good work looking into the role of migration agents uh, and fake visas. And this has been a very common route, especially into Australia, New Zealand and other markets where, you know, in that mix of people coming in uh, under education visas or other short term visas, quite often there being there are people who have been trafficked. Uh, and are in that mix. Uh, and these are often uh, organized by organized crime. Uh, and in this case, uh, Chinese organized crime bringing girls in from Asia uh, who were then shunted around, especially uh, according to the story, they were moved around the, uh, the main major mining centers uh, where there is a demand from a mainly male population for sexual services. Uh, these, these poor victims were moved around systematically flown around to these centers to provide services. Uh, another point I'd like to raise is, is also uh, about international uh, gangs and groups. And now these are two stories about uh, Brazilian organized crime, bringing in uh, Brazilian uh, women and also trans into uh, Australia. Uh, and uh, this, obviously, this case, uh, there, there was a major arrest case done, and they understood more about the ring. But these cases are ongoing uh, as we speak. I was checking some out recently. Uh, and I've, as I said, I, I've been working on a big uh, 
uh, project in the UK, which was also looking at the South Americans uh, being brought in at scale into uh, the UK uh, to to uh, to really uh, fulfil uh, a lot of the um, the sexual services uh, in the UK. Um, this story I also saw was a. Uh, uh, a recent deportation of a uh, Chinese uh, syndicate boss. Uh, he'd been uh, arrested and now deported. Uh, the funny thing is, well, not funny at all, was he, before he came to Australia, he was deported from the UK for running the same thing. So I don't think he will give up. Uh, you know, this is, he's found his sweet spot in, in actually operating. Uh, and this is just a risk, is being arrested and then serving his time uh, and, um, you know, being deported. Uh, I'm surprised at this attitude to deport him. Uh, this is the kind of person that sort of needs to be uh, put away uh, for a very long time. But, um, you know, we should take note of this if he's not on uh, your internal lists of people you don't want to be doing business with or having any transactions with. I would suggest he is a good candidate. More recently, there was a case... Uh, very good work by the AFP in Australia, uh, arresting a number of uh, men in uh, Australia, but also uh, other counterparts in Indonesia who are bringing young girls, uh, young children into Australia uh, from Indonesia uh, for sex trafficking purposes. So uh, very sad, good that they've stopped this one case and take action. But uh, how many others are out there? I, I shudder to think. And one thing I would just like to mention is, is that each victim of sex trafficking, and, and Matt can speak to this very powerfully, as he, I've heard him many times, you know, the, the, the despair uh, of their, they're stuck in their situation. Uh, they're always hopeful that they will be rescued, but it rarely comes. But this is then also combined with the horrific abuse that they're given. Like I said, punters are not nice people. They're living out their sexual fantasies on someone who can't fight back. Uh, and to make them co you know, to willing to do this, they're often given drugs to numb the pain. And you can see these stories, which are true stories from victims. Uh, and you see these ladies, they look very nice ladies. Uh, thankfully, I, I, I hope they're on the path to, to recovery and restitution. Um, but you can see their quotes uh, that this was a absolutely horrific experience, um, you know, sadistic forms of abuse. So let's not glamorize or think this is a nice thing. It is not. And it's something that we as a society definitely should stand up and fight with everything we have um, because this is abhorrent. So the, the main focus I want to bring today uh, is also that this whole arena has shifted from street corners, from uh, magazines, from ads in papers, uh, from the old world into the new. It has very much gone online. Uh, and the reason why we know this actually came uh, much from the, the, the conflict in Ukraine uh, and that very sadly we saw as many uh, families move from the east of Ukraine across to the west uh, and to neighboring countries. Um, they were targeted, especially at the borders by human traffickers. Uh, and there are many stories from other agencies where, especially if an attractive girl or mum uh, would be targeted, but also ads online offering uh, assistance, uh, you know, humanitarian help, uh, lodging and so on, were also put up by traffickers. And so we've seen, uh, you know, quite a, an increase in demand for Ukrainian porn uh, and searches for, for Ukrainian escorts. We've also seen an increase on content uh, for Ukrainian women and girls online. Uh, and also we've seen, uh, as I said, all the, the ads, the offers of help and so on, the, the wolf in sheep's clothing ads um, also online. So, you know, often because we are now very dependent on social media and technology. Uh, people look for these things, uh, look for offers of help online without verification. They think it's very kind, they need help, uh, and they fall into the snare, the trap. So uh, this came from the OSCE, uh, the um, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, you can go and have a look at their findings on this if you have interest. 
I just show you a couple of ads of what ads look like. These are a couple of Ukrainian ads. They're old. They're not current. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go into too much detail about them. But you can see uh, what they show is is obviously the, the, the girl who's or, or person who's being advertised and various different poses. They have a lot of sort of biographical details about who they are. Usually the name is fake. Uh, uh, and often the other details can be fake. But the things that are, are, are often correct is the phone number uh, and often the social media details and, of course, the photo. So th there is a new currency uh, for red flags uh, and for intelligence in, in this arena. Uh, it is no longer looking for, for correct names, passport numbers, dates of birth, because all of these probably won't be correct. But phone numbers, the photos, uh, and the, the social media uh, are, because that is the way that punters will connect with this, this the person being advertised. There are also other red flags in each ad, and I'll speak very briefly about them uh, at the end of the, the talk. Uh, but in this case, on the right, the girl is advertising herself as a porn star. You know, this is obviously marketing, but is it also an indicator of the types of services that she's willing or she's being advertised as, as willing to uh, accept or undergo? And usually these are not nice. So these, again, this could be a red flag into this ad. I think what I also want to do is take a step back from the ads, uh, and I'll come back to them in a minute, but this new online environment of uh, recruiting and advertising people for commercial sex uh, actually sits on top of a whole support network, a logistics network. And this is where I believe as financial compliance uh, professionals, you, you may have a, a quite a powerful role because many of these sort of uh, support agencies may be clients of yours, maybe unwittingly or maybe not. So if we just go from left to right, uh, recruitment. So obviously, this is often on social media, but it also could be, uh, you know, escort agencies. If you're uh, having those as clients, modeling agencies, recruitment agencies, these typically within the mix, there are good and evil. Um, one thing I did a few years ago was look at uh, Facebook ads um, in Thailand. And I, I worked with a third party to look at all the Facebook ads in Thailand that were purporting to be modeling agencies. I gave them uh, some keywords and they came back. I was stunned that there were not one, 10 or 100. There were thousands of modeling agencies in Thailand on Facebook. And often these look very good, but there was no substance behind them. But you could also see that they would be looking across Facebook uh, and looking for individuals they'd like to target uh, and building up connections that way. So this, this area is really uh, a very good hunting ground for human traffickers to, to purport to be something uh, and then hunt across different types of social media for the people they'd like to recruit. When they finally fall into the snare and are recruited, and often it is very vicious because they will recruit often a young lady and say, oh, you have a great potential. You need to pay us some money for your portfolio to get a professional uh, photos taken, which they do. Uh, and then those photos are actually just a, a way of hooking that person in because that person then thinks, if I've paid money to these people and I've got photos, they must be genuine, right? Unfortunately, no. And often then, they are then moved on their first appointment, maybe internally in the country, uh, I need you to go here, or, or even overseas. And then this is where, uh, unfortunately, the snare uh, gets uh, tighter or deeper. Uh, and then they are actually then starting to be advertised on the third category, which is on the adult service websites or online exchanges. So there are different types of platforms here. You know, some are sort of... Um, advertising areas, uh, you know, your Alibabas and things like that, uh, where they have maybe a uh, one section is for personal ads or personal services, or there are specific types of site that are really just catering to uh, adult services. And I'll show you some examples a little bit later on. Our key in this new paradigm is communication. So on the ads will be a genuine phone number. It may not be actually for the girl, it may be for the trafficker. Uh, but this will be, uh, you know, a genuine number. It could be a burner phone, but quite often not. 
uh, in my experience in the previous project, is that this number actually is recycled quite often because once punters have got used to dialing it, they've, they've kept it, that number has a value. So they don't just want it to come and go in 90 days. So, you know, if you're a compliance professional uh, in this new paradigm of online forced commercial sex, phone numbers, mobile phone numbers are one of the key uh, trading points of, of, you know, showing you uh, what's going on. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later on. Now, the next bit is where is the service delivered? Now, this has to be a physical delivery. We're not talking about virtual sex. Um, so these are often hotels and motels, but by far the more common I found recently is, is sort of short-term rented apartments, your Airbnbs and so on. Uh, and again, if, if, you're, if you're working with Airbnb or a similar sort of short-term letting agency, it's very common that the syndicates will target this. Um, I, I recently found uh, a, a syndicate uh, in the middle of, of the UK in a city. Um, there were some new apartments uh, had been obviously booked on quite a long term by a human trafficking syndicate uh, running uh, about 60 uh, victims per night out of these apartments. Uh, and the, the victims were being brought in advertised for a few days at that of those apartments and then moved on systematically. So we could see they would spend five to seven days in each location before they were being moved to the next because we were able to look back at the previous ads and see where they were being offered uh, and where they went on to after that location. And we saw a very systematic uh, people being moved around the country five to seven days in each location. Now, if you're trying to move uh, so many uh, victims of human trafficking, you obviously don't want them to do it themselves. You're going to arrange uh, cars or, or minibuses or whatever uh, and people you can trust. So again, as we'll talk about in a minute, you know, things like Uber, uh, Grab, other types of ride uh, sharing uh, facilities are very popular uh, and, you know, sort of um, high end uh, chauffeured car services as well. And lastly, payment is, is very much less cash in many markets now. It's very much online. Some of the ads will specify the types of payments they're willing or not willing to receive. Often we see it's payment cards, payment apps, uh, or person-to-person -person payments. So let me back up what I've just said with some very interesting data from a report from the U.S. So it is based on U.S. Uh, experiences, but I think there's a, you know, some lessons to be learned here. So here on the left, they said, what are the top 10 platforms used in recruitment of victims uh, in that period of 2019 to 2022? Number one was Facebook, followed by Snapchat and Instagram. So we know that these are very key portals uh, for recruitment. And then soliciting uh, is the other graph. Uh, so often here, 53% uh, was on the internet. So those ads uh, and then the sort of traditional ways of on the street or in a bar or a massage parlor, very much in the minority. So we see this shift that, you know, a lot uh, of solicitation is now done online. Coercion, how are victims controlled? Well, for adults, it's the upper chart. It's, it's through withholding pay or physical abuse or threats uh, or exploitation uh, using substance uh, abuse. Uh, and the lower part, you know, is rape or sexual violence. Now, very sadly, the lower graph is talking about minors and how they're being controlled. And again, pay is, is, is one thing, but then rape or sexual violence is the number two way of controlling a minor. Uh, what a terrible thing to be done to a young person. Not only how they, you know, been trapped and tricked uh, and losing hope and despair, but then controlled through sexual violence. Again, I mentioned the importance of, of uh, transportation, moving victims around. And you can see quite remarkably in this case, in the States, that the scheduled airlines, commercial airlines are used in some cases, although not in the major way. But then you can see in the second bar chart, ride shares, Uber, Lyft, and so on are very popular. Uh, and that's actually what the uh, the first video I showed you uh, was, a, was developed for, was taxi drivers and, and these uh, you know, ride hailing um, uh, drivers as well as to tell them you could be transporting a victim of human trafficking. And you can see other methods as well on there. 
The final point I want to make from this uh, report, and I would encourage you to download it. I will send a, a redacted uh, deck uh, through uh, to the team and they'll share it with you. Uh, I will have to take out some of the uh, the data, of course, or some of the, the images. Uh, but this one, this report, the, the link will be there and I would encourage you to go and get it. You can see there, and I'm not making any uh, negative comments about any of the named entities on there because some of the staff may be on this call. But you know, you can see that these types, the top uh, three are Cash App, PayPal, and Venmo. In the US, uh, these are very popular between uh, payment, so payment platforms used uh, between traffickers and buyers to pay for sex. Before I change uh, tag, I just, again, want to come back to this area. It is very low risk and very high reward. And this chart, you may have seen it before, it was done by in Canada uh, by the C Criminal Intelligence Service in 2008. But the bottom bar is what I want to show you. So one person, one trafficker controlling 10 females earns 3.276 million Canadian dollars in one year tax-free. Now, I hate to say it, but this is the kind of person who would walk into a bank into the uh, wealth unit, the private bank, be showered with the, uh, the rose petals, given the free cups of coffee, and how do we help you, sir? You know, this is a serious amount of money just from managing, coercing, controlling 10 females to work for them, 3.276 million. And the risk is low of being arrested and like uh, some of the examples I showed you before, uh, once they're arrested, they go and do their time and then they're deported uh, if they're a foreign national to go somewhere else and carry on. So this is why, ladies and gentlemen, it is so powerful. Uh, this very sadly forced commercial sexual exploitation. It is a rich, rich revenue for criminals. Just want to show you another quick Video, I hope this works. They always told us if we leave, they'll beat us till we are black and blue. And they will, they will put our body in a black garbage bag. And then they put our body in the Lake Ontario and no one will ever know what happened to us. Good Lord, this could have helped in so many investigations. That's black and white evidence right there that the victim is making the money, but she's not spending it on herself. An amazing video, an incredibly brave uh, woman, Timea, uh, who actually has changed the way that we see the role of, of financial professionals um, in fighting human trafficking. And she, she was one of the sort of uh, inspirations for Project Protect in, in Canada, uh, which was this sort of excellent public-private partnership where 
banks uh, using information from Timea could actually start to uh, look for uh, both the victims and traffickers uh, and file SARS. Uh, but those were expedited because they they put it on the word Project Protect and the deal with the FIU was anything with a Project Protect uh, code word would be prioritized. Uh, and so the FIU started to get some excellent um, SARS coming in uh, and were prioritized them, could develop some fantastic intelligence packages out to law enforcement uh, and you know, really started to change the game in fighting human traffickers, identifying them from their uh, transaction patterns. So again, I'll leave you the link to this. Uh, you can go and have a look at the video on, on YouTube. Um, I just want to very quickly, I, I had to put some work together for a US law enforcement department on, on how, basic, how, how does it work? Uh, and so this was my, my very quick working I just want to walk through it. There are two slides. So this is the first one. Um, so we have on the left box, the punter or client uh, paying to the sex worker vic or victim for, for services. So they will maybe use cash or a cash app or a payment card. Um, and then the, the sex worker or victim has to pay the controller, or the trafficker or the pimp. Uh, how will they do that? Well, it could be cash, but uh, it could probably more likely be a transfer into an account or uh, through an ATM, or, or it could be a payment app or payment card again. And so then we have this uh, controlling account run by the, the controller or pimp. Now, I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about that on the next slide. But obviously, the, the next one of the outputs from this is into the lifestyle of the trafficker or pimp, because they don't do it uh, for fun. They do it to make money and fund the criminal lifestyle. And from that, they're going to fund all of their luxury flats and houses and cars and investments, uh, private education, luxury holidays, and so on. So this is really, you know, how the funds would flow across. And there's some very good uh, work on this on the Mekong Club's website, uh, some typologies there. One of them is about uh, sex trafficking. So again, it sort of uh, reinforces what I'm just saying here. But if we look at activity, uh, and Tamea mentioned this in the video, um, if we look at the sex worker and if they have an account, then we see transfers in perhaps from the client or transfers in of money. And we see transfers out uh, to, to the pimp uh, and also payments for expenses. So they may have to pay for their hotel or, or, or their local transport or, or sanitary products or products for sex work. Uh, but they won't be paying for things like uh, lifestyle, you know, shopping, food, travel, insurance, um, holidays, that kind of thing. So this is one of the differentiators when you're looking at accounts is what Tamea was talking about is it, it's, it's got a very sort of stylized pattern, uh, which doesn't replicate a normal sort of person's uh, use of their account. When we move to number three, which is the pimp or controller's accounts, you can, this is very important once this has been identified, because if we go back to that uh, 3.276 million uh, number that I gave you a couple of slides back, you know, that controller had 10 victims. So you would suspect to see now 10, you know, groups of money coming in. But if you only know one and you can see this account, then you can actually identify the nine others of, from the funds coming in. And you can sort of reverse work it backwards to see, are these nine others also poor victims? Also, you'd expect this account to be active in sort of uh, paying a lot more costs. So it may be booking the Airbnbs. It may be arranging with the Ubers. It may be booking flights. It may be paying associates or recruitment agencies. Uh, it, it could be a lot more coming in and out of this account. So this account is key to understand the size and scale of the network. And lastly, when you go to the lifestyle account, well, we've already talked about that, they'll be in and out for funding the criminal lifestyle. I just want to uh, tell you a quick story uh, about number three. So I was working on a case in East Africa uh, where uh, law enforcement had arrested uh, a, uh, a brothel owner uh, in a bar uh, and he was bringing in girls from Nepal. And they charged the case to court uh, for the brothel owner or the bar owner and the, the 12 victims. Uh, and it went to court uh, and he was convicted quite a low sentence uh, for this case. 
it was very sad that he had not been given financial investigation training or had access to a financial investigator because uh, I, I managed to work with other groups and we very quickly went out to a, uh, a global money service provider and said, could you, you know, uh, well, under authority from the, from the law enforcement, could you get the, the banking details or any transactions to do with the, the, the suspect? Within a day, they came back and showed that this suspect had been sending money to Nepal for five years, obviously to his recruiter there. Um, but it shows it wasn't just those 12 women and it hadn't been just going on for six months. It had been going on for five years. But also, interestingly, he'd been receiving money from other countries where obviously there were similar operations happening in neighboring, neighboring countries and his money, his profits were going to the Middle East, to Dubai, uh, because that's obviously where his lifestyle uh, was being funded. So, uh, you know, I, I speak on this from experience that, you know, the, the financial side, looking at the network of financial transactions around uh, a case can un uncover other victims, can uncover the size and scale of the network and other uh, conspirators as well. Now, just coming back to, to what's happening in Australia. So, again, this is just an example of a commercial sex uh, ad website. I'm not making any allegations about it. I just want to put it up here as an example, uh, and I will not be sharing this. But you can see the sort of style that there are uh, available in Australia, New Zealand, and, and, and many countries. Uh, and this one is another one. Uh, and you can see, I just want you to look at the middle uh, area where the different types of services that you can search on uh, are are available, uh, whether you're into erotic massage or fetish uh, or, or whatever. Um, you know, there seems to be victims or sorry, people available to service a variety of, of, of needs. Uh, and this will include some of them will be victims. But again, some of them will be perhaps genuine uh, sex workers. And it it is difficult to sometimes decide whether they are voluntarily doing it or they're being coerced and controlled into it. But this is the new hunting ground, ladies and gentlemen, for where people who are being trafficked uh, are often being uh, advertised uh, and through it exploited. I did some work last year on uh, a list of commercial ad platforms in, in Oz. Uh, it's not complete. Uh, and, you know, I, again, I make no uh, assertions or allegations against any of them. It was just a, a quick scrub of what's out there. Uh, and you can see there are lots of different types of names. Some of them are sort of marketplace sites uh, and some of them are very specific sites that offer specific services uh, or specific nationalities. Um, and this, again, is the new paradigm. This is where a lot of uh, poor forced commercial sex trafficking victims are being exploited on and advertised on. Uh, just before the call, we were talking, and, and there hasn't been much work done to look at this at any level uh, on a global basis. Um, the only work I've seen and know of is has been done, again, by, in, the, in Europe by the OSCE, uh, and they did a couple of years ago. They asked their member states to go out and map uh, the online landscape, uh, and they came back, and you can download the report to see what each country has come back with, but, you know, something very similar to this for each country, um, but, you know, it, it's hundreds of websites in each country, uh, and some of them provide services not just in one country, but in a region, uh, and some are global as well, so it, it is very interesting. Uh, it, it is a real rabbit hole once you start looking into it, as I found out, um, you can sort of get taken down a lot of streams. Uh, but some of the, the red flags that uh, they identified of how you can look across the ad landscape and look for inconsistencies or, or, or red flags, I, I've put here on the screen on the right. Um, so inconsistent ages, inconsistent aliases, uh, frequent movement, as I mentioned, where people are being moved around, uh, you know, every five to seven days or advertised as new in town, new girl. This is often uh, a red flag. Uh, sometimes there are 
common phone numbers across multiple ads. So this means there is a, either a, a phone booking center or a trafficker is running uh, multiple uh, victims or you know advertised separately, but there is one common phone number. Uh, it could be that uh, the ethnicity or nationality is referenced to, as I mentioned, Brazilians are very popular uh, in many markets now. They they have a sort of a uh, an, is an illusion that they are very voluptuous and uh, you know uh, party types, uh, and so they're very popular, uh, especially as providing as providers of sexual services. Uh, that doesn't mean that all Brazilians uh, are, <laughs> and very often there a lot are exploited. Uh, as models from Brazil and brought to, to Europe and maybe to Australia, New Zealand uh, to offer sexual services. Um, you know, the, the one down further, unconventional sex advertise. This is really where extreme risk uh, sexual services being offered at quite a low price uh, is very much an indicator that something's not right. Um, you know, we've actually conducted focus groups with uh, genuine sex workers uh, and there are certain types of service they will not entertain. Uh, and they also gave us an indication of their pricing. Uh, and usually when you see something, you know, well below uh, the standard pricing, you know, there's something not quite right. Uh, and I, I won't go through the other uh, ones, but uh, often there's, there's some way of you know, devaluing or denigrating uh, the image to make it look more appealing. Um, you know, and often we found uh, when people were being advertised in sort of certain positions or certain degrees of, of nudity uh, in a denigrating way, uh, it obviously indicates it's not voluntary and um, there must be a risk there. So I've sort of tried to explain a little bit about the new sort of paradigm, the new landscape. I just want to share this video, uh, which is from the, the made third by a third party of the company I was working with up until quite recently. Um, In human trafficking, victims are used over and over and over again for the financial gain of traffickers. It's a very dark industry. There are literally hundreds of thousands of advertisements each day for the commercial sex industry. When law enforcement receives a tip, that can include their name, their phone number, a picture of the victim. They can use Traffic Jam and sift through this content in seconds to quickly identify if they have a match on that victim. There was an organized crime ring that was operating brothels in 12 cities then Ring was taken down by the FBI, supported by Marinus Analytics. At the end of the day, it's not about the data, it's really about the people. So Marinus Analytics is a, a private company uh, using AI. Um, they are really designed to help law enforcement to, to master this new landscape and be able to, to crawl at scale across uh, multiple sites and look for, for uh, red flags and commonalities. I, I really can't say much more than that. But if you are from law enforcement on the call uh, and you'd like to know more, I'd be very happy. Uh, please contact the team and I can put you in touch with them if, if you're not using it. It is widely used across the US, Canada, uh, the UK, uh, and increasingly across Europe uh, as a sort of a, a powerful tool set to, to, to investigate this new paradigm. Um, you know, as was mentioned on here, uh, on this video uh, by the CEO, um, phone numbers are, are the link. And uh, so uh, I would hope that as, as law enforcement get more adept at investigating these types of case, they will start coming to, to uh, financial institutions with phone numbers and saying, look, you know, do you know anything about these phone numbers? And that probably quite likely has come from an investigation uh, and some of the, the, the sites that I've been talking about this morning. So just for the final few slides before we close up, I do apologize, I'm, I'm overrunning slightly. Um, so this quote I saw recently, um, but it, it's from a, a criminal. If you get caught smuggling cocaine, you're looking at 20 years. If you smuggle women, the profits can be just as high. But if you get caught, the only thing you're looking at is living off the immoral earnings. The most you'll get is three years in jail. If you're a criminal, the choice about which to go for is pretty simple. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what we're facing. 
This is a highly lucrative industry, very sadly, with very low risks. But the key is the money. Uh, it's huge revenues. It is going through payment systems. And that's where I believe uh, as financial compliance professionals, you know, you are uh, uniquely positioned to, to actually do something more and do something more powerful that, than we've been doing to date. So just in some, uh, some of the figures I've mentioned, uh, it really is a big business uh, and payments are the key. So I'd, I would hope that uh, after this uh, talk, you, you feel uh, somewhat energized that uh, more needs to be done. Um, and that, uh, you know, perhaps you, you would be kind enough to, to lend your time and talents uh, in helping that, both in a personal sense and a professional sense, to help your organization make sure that you are not facilitating others who are facilitating this despicable business. Uh, on that note, I'll, I'll end uh, and hand the floor back to Elena. Thank you very much.